Matt Huggins is a 2014 graduate of the University of Washington. Uh, there he served as a chapter president of a 110-man chapter. Uh, that's a WA beta chapter, if you're tracking. Uh, after graduation, uh, Matt and I actually together joined the SIGEP headquarters staff uh, for a brief time together where, where Matt then served as a regional director, uh, serving 24 chapters across the Midwest United States. And then he went on to become a chapter services director where he kind of supported and helped the regional directors from, from the hiring and training and then ongoing support process for over a hundred chapters in the nation. So it's, it's very uh, possible that Matt has worked directly with, with some of your chapters. Uh, over three years, uh, over the next three years on staff, uh, he also uh, worked to, to complete his CPA and then joined the professional services for, firm Grant Thornton. Uh, today, he is a manager in the Finance Transformation Group, where he helps CFOs and corporate leaders who are looking to modernize their finance and accounting teams and functions. So we're super pumped to have Matt here as a guest speaker. Without further ado, I will turn it over. Matt. Thank you, sir. Uh, evening, everyone. I'll just get right into it. And with that, if you need to know one thing about me, just know this. I'm insatiably curious. It has been the driving force in my personal and my professional life. And as I'm sure many of you have heard in your classes or if you're following the news, you probably know that the finance sector is a particularly head spinning industry to be in if you're insatiably curious. Seems like every day there's some new trend or some new breakthrough of technology to try to get your head around, whether it's intelligent automation, blockchain technology, or something like robotic process automation. Right? These are things you're probably hearing about in class. And for me, being an early professional out in the industry, I'm doing my best to stay on top of these latest breakthroughs. But I got to tell you guys, often it feels like I'm just out there competing in a big sandbox and I'm doing the best I can to, to dig and to focus on the right areas that I need to be focusing on. But so often it feels like is digging into intelligent automation even the right spot to be focusing my time? Or should I be focusing in two, three, four different other areas? And so what I wanna talk about and share with you tonight is actually a little bit of a self pivot I've started making. And instead of chasing the latest and the greatest of innovations and breakthroughs, recently I've really tried to start focusing in on instead being the guy in the room asking questions. And it's not asking questions for the sake of asking questions. It's asking the right kinds of questions. And so that, that's really what I wanna talk through with you tonight is how can being the guy that's willing to ask the right types of questions be helpful not only for you as a vice president of finance, but also for you and your future careers. And so the first question I started thinking about is more at a meta level of, have we as a society lost the art of asking good questions? And let me, let me tell you a quick story with that. So I recently just moved back to my home in Seattle. It's, can't really see it, but the Cascade Mountains are right there out the window. And I moved back from Philadelphia. And my wife's been interviewing at several different places trying to get a job. She recently interviewed with someone for 45 minutes. And in that 45 minute interview, the man proceeded to tell her all about the company, the perks, all the benefits, the great connections the company has. And never once did he ask her a question. And as she was relating that back to me later that night, I was really excited for her. Well, that's great if you didn't ask questions, it means they really like you, right? And I was surprised when she came back and said, they don't even know me. Worse yet, they don't even care to get to know me. Now, what my wife and I think a lot of us innately understand is that asking questions helps to build relationships. And this was backed up by a recent study done by Harvard where they basically took thousands of participants and had them take part in online speed dates, 15 minute speed dates. Now, some of the participants were instructed to ask at a minimum of nine questions in those 15 minutes. 
Others were instructed to ask no more than four questions. What they found is that those that asked more questions were both better liked by the person on the other end of the date, and they also managed to learn more about their partner. So what if instead that interviewer hadn't rather asked my wife, what is it you're looking to get from this role? Or what do you find interesting about our company? How much more effective would you have been? So I ask again, have we as a society lost the mm -hmm. art of asking good questions? How the fuck? Do one of my classes live? And I'm going to start with one question right here, and that'd be, can we just make sure we're all on mute? Thank you very much. But if we have lost the art of asking questions, I totally get it. Right? The world is moving fast. We need answers. A lot of times, if we're stumped with something, we'll go online, we'll find a headline, we'll find a couple supporting sentences, and we're good. We keep moving. And if you think about it through school all the way up through pretty much your professional life, it seems we put more emphasis on having the answers than being the one to ask the questions. Now, Zach introduced a little bit of my background of, of what I do now. And basically, professionally, companies pay me to help make their accounting and finance teams more efficient. And they take those, they want quick solutions, they take those solutions, they build on them, and they keep going. But what that really means is that they're paying me to actually slow down, to listen, and to ask the right questions. Because only then can me and my team start to put together the right options to help them out moving forward. And so here we are, we're probably four minutes in, and I haven't said anything about SIGEP, and I really haven't talked all that much about you all. You all tuned in right now as the Vice President of Finance staring at your webcam, watching me talk, or maybe at this point, maybe you're, you're scrolling on your phone. I think I saw one individual driving and walking around, right? I haven't really brought this back to our SIGF world. So let's do that. Let's talk about what the foundational meaning you take away for all of you will be from this. And that is this, asking the right questions matter. It matters for you in your personal life, it matters for you in your professional life, and it's gonna matter for you for the type of successful year you're gonna have this year as a vice president. And so I wanna spend the rest of this time really hitting on two concepts and then following up with just a short activity to put those concepts into action. And to start off, the first concept's really straightforward. Ask anything. And with that, I just mean find one question to ask because it is especially hard in the virtual world today, or even the hybrid virtual world, to focus and to pay attention, especially if you're going from virtual class to virtual class or virtual meeting to virtual meeting. So find one question to ask. And what that does is it takes you from a passive to an active participant. And even if that question is something you follow up with an email or a text because you don't wanna ask it there in the session, that's fine. Because at the end of the day, just simply asking that question not only is going to help you learn by getting that answer, it's also, also going to start to help form a relationship with that presenter or that professor that you ask it to. So if we can get behind the first concept, it's pretty straightforward. Just find a way to ask anything during the meeting. Just that one question. Now, the second concept builds on the first. And we're going to spend a little bit more time with the second concept. And the second concept starts to go into the types of questions we're asking. And to illustrate that, I actually want to share something with you all. So this is a quadrant that's going to help frame the types of questions we ask. And to kind of run through the quadrants, I'll go section by section. The first of the four types of questions are clarifying questions. Now, this seems like the most obvious type of question, but it's actually one of the most commonly overlooked. And whether it's because we're in a haste to get to an answer, we make an assumption, or because we're afraid to ask, we often don't focus on a clarifying question, which can be as simple as, what I'm hearing you say is this, do I have that correct? It's all about getting your understanding of the specific problem or issue at hand. Next up are adjoining questions. So these questions, too, are focused on the, the issue at hand, but it takes your understanding and stretches it and tests it by applying it to a related issue. 
So an example of a, an adjoining question might be, well, I know that this worked really well with this group, but could it also apply to this other group? Right? Again, it's testing your understanding by applying it to a related area. The third type of question is funneling. Now for us finance folks, this tends to come a little bit more natural, right? This is digging down on that specific issue in order to learn something new. So this could be something like, well, where did that number come from? Or can you tell me more about the process you took to get here, right? It's about digging in to a specific thing that was brought up. And then the fourth and final quadrant and type of question is an elevating question. Now, this is more of the see the forest, not the individual trees type of question, where you zoom back and ask, are we even looking at the right thing here? Or are we even thinking about the right question? It's more of a high level question to pull you back and to reset your perspectives. So we talked about this grid. Again, I'm a big believer in making stuff tangible. So let's try to use this now in a tangible example that's relatable to us. So let's say you get into one of the breakout sessions, right? And you're talking to your facilitators about the things you need to prioritize for this upcoming year, you know, all the challenges you're gonna face as a vice president of finance. And we start talking about collecting dues. And your facilitator brings up, well, you know, you really shouldn't be using Venmo to collect chapter dues. Now, some of you might be sitting there at your computer thinking, well, what the heck? Like, we've always used Venmo. And you might be afraid to ask, well, why not? Others of you might say, well, you know, screw that guy. Venmo works great for us, and we've always done it that way, so we're still going to do it. But let's, let's try out this quadrant in looking at the types of questions you could structure around why Venmo might not be the best method for collecting dues. So we'll start with a clarifying question. And maybe a clarifying question here might be, so if I'm hearing you right, collecting chapter dues over Venmo could expose me to tax liabilities or other legal liabilities. Do I have that correct? Again, clarifying, trying to get more understanding about the specific thing at hand. Now, moving this to a funneling question, you might then ask, well, can you tell me more about specific examples of other vice presidents of finance that have run into issues by using Venmo? And see how, again, funneling, we're diving deeper into the specific topic, but looking to gain more information through it. Now, if you move to the adjoining quadrant, maybe you structure a question like, well, if I'm going to face that kind of liability as a vice president in this area, what about having my name on the bank account? What kind of, ex what kind of liability does that expose, expose me to with our chapter expenditures? Right, again, taking that understanding you have of one area, but now applying it to a different. And then finally, an elevating question might be something like, well, let's take a step back and say, why do we use Venmo? Well, it's guys are already familiar with it. It's pretty much free to use. And, you know, it's pretty easy to use. Okay, so those are the attributes of why we use it. What is an alternative that can meet some, if not all of those attributes? Again, the point of an elevating question to zoom back and look at the bigger picture. So I hope you can start to see through that example how by framing questions around this quadrant and playing around with what type of question you're asking, you can elicit a much richer response than just if you ask, well, why not? Or worse, if you don't ask the question at all. So I'm not here to actually answer the specific question around Van Mo. Nor am I here to answer all your questions around the spring bill, or maybe the half a dozen other questions maybe that are burning in the back of your mind um, coming up on this upcoming year. And the truth is I really only have 20 minutes, so I don't have a lot of time to do that. But as Zach said at the start of the call, there is actually a dedicated session coming up that's gonna be focused much more on those specific SIGEP questions. For me, the best thing I can do for you all right now is just make sure that those questions you're asking are out are really getting at the core thing you want to find out because so often we're in a rush to just maybe ask the question check the box and get an answer that when we come back to our chapters and try to explain this is why we can't use Venmo we get obliterated they start asking a million different questions and trying to understand why and all of a sudden we realize shoot 
we didn't get enough information because we didn't ask the right types of questions. And that's how we always end up falling back on, well, headquarters says so. And that really does no one any good. So again, my goal here today is to help form the right types of questions and to help you come up with those right types of questions. But like anything, it's, it's gonna take practice. And so what I wanna do here is first just recap those two concepts and then give us some time to actually put those concepts into action. So again, the two concepts were this. One, ask anything. Find that one question in a class or a meeting, write it down and ask it. If it's not asked live, then fine, send it as a follow-up email, but ask something. And then the second concept was focus on the types of questions you ask, whether it's a clarifying, a joining, funneling, or elevating. So now we're gonna do a little bit of an activity. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you each two minutes. And in those two minutes, I want you to write down the top questions that you have as a vice president of finance or the top questions that you're getting from other brothers in the chapter related to finance. So again, two minutes to write down on a notepad, on the note section in your phone or on a Word document, but write down the top questions you're getting from your brothers in the chapter about finance or that you have about finance. And then from there, we're gonna take that to a different level. So two minutes are starting now. Seems like the screen share stopped working there. So up on the screen is actually the quadrant. If you find yourself thinking like, gosh, what were the four quadrants again? Again, thinking through those questions you're hearing from your brothers or you yourself have coming into the position. Coming up on one minute left. All right, halfway done. You got one minute left. Coming up on 30 seconds left. Try to get out a few more questions if you can. Again, we won't be able to answer these tonight necessarily, but again, great to have a list of questions. It'll be a good opportunity to practice some of those types of questions. Got about 15 seconds left. Then we'll move on to step two. About three, two, one. Okay, so now that you have your list, list of questions, the next thing up is I'm gonna ask, give you 30 seconds to go through and next to each question you just wrote down, you're gonna mark whether it's a clarifying question, is it an elevating, funneling, or a joining? Now, if you're going through it and you're like, I really don't know which of the four this falls into, just leave it blank and skip it. We'll talk about those ones later. 
But for now, 30 seconds, go through and mark it either as one of the four quadrants, which we'll see up on the screen. 30 seconds starts now. Few more seconds left. Go ahead and mark them down. Clarifying, adjoining, funneling, or elevating. Okay. So go ahead and go pencils down or fingers down if you were typing. And take a look at your list, right? Again, this is just an off the cuff activity. And take a look. Do you find that more of your questions tend to be clarifying? joining, elevating. And I would make a guess that the majority might be clarifying. Why? Well, you're relatively new to the position. And a lot of the types of questions you probably have starting off are ones that are just clarifying some of the roles and responsibilities of the position. But I also want to take the chance to actually kind of hear how this process went and hear about some of the questions you formulated. So, I'm gonna ask that either in the Zoom group chat or in a Zoom private chat, you actually submit one of your most pressing questions. You know, one of those questions that's top of mind. And we'll talk about it together and see how we can go about framing good questions through some real examples. So I'll give you a second. Zach, I'm gonna ask for, for your help here too, reading off some responses as they come in. But I'm just curious to hear about what one of those pressing questions is. Again, it could be in the group chat or it could be in a private chat. All right, we have one in so far. Feel free to send in some more. Again, they could be SIGEP related, they could be non SIGEP related. We'll have time for an actual QA at the end of this. This is about helping frame questions. Okay, we did get one from James. So let's see here. Okay, thank you, Connor and Devin. Okay, here we go, got some rolling in. Okay, so let's, let's look at this one here. What are good things to look into when looking for a savings account? So that was one of the questions submitted. What are good things to look into when looking for a savings account? Now, Donovan, hate to put you on the spot, my friend, but would you actually mind coming off mute? I, I do wanna to talk to you a little bit about this. Donovan, let me know when you're able to come off. Yep. Hey, Donovan. Thank you Hi. for the question. So tell me, Donovan, did you have this as a clarifying question, adjoining, funneling, or elevating? I put it as a funneling, but I don't know if that was correct. I couldn't really figure it out. Okay. Well, let's here, let's let's talk through that a little bit then. So what are good things to look for when looking into a savings account? So I imagine at the heart of this. And maybe the, the question there is just like, okay, what are the important things about a savings account, right? So that might be the clarifying question that then this is the funneling question for. So you're trying to understand, you know, what do I need to look for when getting a savings account? Now, some other questions you might raise off of this might be a type of adjoining question. Now, Don, do you have an idea of maybe how you could build on this question to ask an adjoining question or kind of stretch this question into another question related to it? Um, I, I don't, I, I, mm. So what that might look like as well is, okay, so where are our checking accounts at? And what, what do we have in our checking account? What are the benefits we're getting there? 
some banks offer some more benefits in terms of online portals or some banks offer, you know, the days of the free toasters are gone, but there are certain perks that come with banks. So do we do a savings account that's attached to our same bank? And what are the benefits that come from that? Or should we be looking at banks elsewhere for a savings account? So that's, that's a good example of what an adjoining type question could be is saying, okay, we know we're funneling in on what are the attributes we're looking for in a good savings account, but how do those attributes tie in if we have a checking account with that bank? Or how are those attributes applied looking at a savings account potentially with a different financial institution? So it's taking that core thing and looking and applying it a little bit elsewhere. All right, thank you, Donovan. Um, let's see, let's, and Donovan, thank you for your, for your help and being willing to participate. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one, one more here, we're gonna look at, why can't we realistically collect 100% of dues? And so this was from Rich. Rich, do you wanna come off and give a little bit of background around that question? Yeah, uh, how's my audio, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, um, yeah, I was just kind of asking this question because I feel like nobody ever really asks. We always project you know, 90% collections, but um, there's a lot of various reasons why we don't get to 100%, but we never really list them out and analyze them and see how we can minimize those factors. Rich, I love this question. So let's let's look at this. So where, if you're using that quadrant, I know it's kind of tough because it's pretty new, but you have those four quadrants of funneling, clarifying. First off, what kind of question was this? I threw it under elevating. I don't know if that's the way you'd see it, but like kind of stepping back to see to, to look at stuff that we don't normally look too deeply in. I love that. And I'd 100% agree, right? You're going to hear, because I think in the vice president of finance, like training materials, it says you shoot for like 90% collections or you budget for 90%. So asking that step back question of why can't we get 100%? So then what might a funneling type of question be? Um, we could say what, percent do we collect the last two or three semesters and is it going up or down yeah diving into diving into that right diving into your historic data maybe asking what process have we been taking to collect dues right and really trying to, to pull the threads on that i think i think that's a really good example and one where again if you just start to look at okay playing across the quadrants you can take that one concept and really start to spread it out so I like that, I appreciate it, Rich, thanks. Thank you. Now, for some of you that might not have known which one going through, if it falls into a clarifying, it falls into a funneling, I, I hope you know by this point, there is no like magic, you're absolutely right because you put it here, you're absolutely wrong. The idea with this quadrant is to help you frame your questions by thinking about, okay, what if I ask this differently? What type of response might I get? Because again, it's easy to ask the just why not question, but instead, if we can frame specifically, we're going to be able to get an answer that better helps us moving forward. And I know we talk a lot about clarifying questions because they're a lot of times when you're just starting off in the position, some of the easiest to ask is just like, what do I need to know? I always like pairing a clarifying question with an adjoining question. So if you have a clarifying question like, how do I go about making a good budget? An adjoining question to that might be, what role does recruitment play with my budget? Because you know what, guys? Recruitment plays a huge deal with your budget. If you have a vice president of recruitment that's saying he's going to recruit 15 guys, and so you budget for 15 guys coming in and you only get seven, that's going to throw off a lot of your budget. The same way that what's your vice president of member, member development going to be doing in terms of programming to engage members? Because if you have a retention drop off of guys, that's also going to impact your budget. So those type of adjoining questions on the initial clarifying question of how do I go about building my budget can be critical. And I'd even throw one more out there and say, throw a funneling question on top of that and say, okay, how does recruitment impact my budget? Do the members of the recruitment team realize how their recruiting impacts my budget? And that's again, as you just start pulling the threads and working around the quadrant and framing your questions, you're gonna to start to unravel more and more that can help you give better answers and ultimately be more successful in your position. So 
thank you to everyone who was willing to, to come off mute and participate. Really appreciate that. And again, if you have that list of questions in front of you, don't throw those out. If anything, work on them a little bit more in terms of framing them around that quadrant. And then on February 10th, when you have the next Vice President of Finance session with Zach, you have a ready-made list of targeted questions that you can start to ask and work through with your, your fellow peers here on this call to find the best solutions to bring back to your chapters. So if you recall from the start, I led with this idea that the, the world is changing fast. And I asked the question, have we lost the art of asking good questions? I was really intentional with the word art because although a Harvard study might have proven some of the cognitive science behind asking questions, it really does come down to art, which takes practice. So as we've said before, tonight is just the first of a series of Vice President of Finance virtual training sessions. You're gonna be hearing from professional, professionals in the industry and your facilitators that have far more experience and knowledge than I do. And better yet, you're gonna be coordinating and learning alongside other vice presidents of finance from chapters across the country. Do not waste the opportunity you all are gonna to have to ask questions because everyone on these calls is here because they either want to learn or they want to help. So if that means asking questions in an email or follow-up, great, do that. But just make sure that you are participating and you are taking the time to ask not only just questions, but the right types of questions to get the information that's gonna help you out. And again, if we learn one thing, and if there's one thing that that interviewer can learn from interviewing my wife, it's that asking questions also helps to build relationships. And there's no better network out there for a young finance professional trying to start off their career than that SIGEP network. So yes, the world is changing fast. And you know what, at the end of the day, you're never gonna be able to stay on top of the latest and greatest breakthroughs and trends, no matter what industry you're in. But what you can be is the person in the room willing to ask questions. Because companies and organizations need the leaders who are gonna ask questions that clarify, questions that funnel, questions that adjoin, and questions that elevate their ideas and innovations. And with that, I wanna end my time with one last question for you. And that is, are you gonna be the one who's gonna be steering the future through the questions you ask? Or are you gonna be the one who's sitting there silently on the sidelines on mute?